it is fun to win, and it is sad to lose, but a day or two afterwards, uh, it doesn't really matter anymore. Richard Chamberlain, philosophical about not winning an Emmy last night for his smashing performance in Shogun. And the winner is, I'm so excited, Daniel J. Travanti for Hill Street Blues. Dan Travanti, a winner, one of eight for a show that does poorly in the ratings called Hill Street Blues. You'll hear more from both Travanti and Chamberlain, along with Burt Reynolds, Deborah Harry, and Lana Turner, as the premiere edition of Entertainment Tonight gets underway from Hollywood for September 14th, 1981. Hi, I'm Tom Halleck, and welcome to our opening night, the premiere edition of Entertainment Tonight. Meet Margie Wallace. Hi, the world of entertainment, the movies, Broadway, music, television, all of it, it changes every day. Each weekday and for an hour on the weekend from now on, we'll bring you an inside look at that world. For the past few years, I've been a part of that world. As a commercial actress, a former Miss World, and a talk show host, I've seen how the world of entertainment turns, and I look forward now to my new role as an observer, and to introducing you to some very interesting people. Burt Reynolds, Lana Turner, Deborah Harry of Blondie, and Richard Chamberlain. Just a few of the people you'll meet tonight. And if you stay around for the week, you'll get to know Brooke Shields, Walter Matthau, Kenny Rogers, Paul Newman, Elizabeth Taylor, Barry Manilow, Larry Hagman, and maybe even a few big names. As long as we'll be telling about all of them, I suppose it's only fair that you know something about us. I've worked on the inside of the so-called dream machine, too. As an actor in movies, stage, and television, I've spent the past 20 years studying this business, and I look forward to studying it now, along with you. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Ron Hendren. You know, I've been covering the entertainment scene, sometimes against its grain, for several years now. And as Tom says, you'll meet a lot of stars here, but you'll also get to know the people who work behind the scenes in Hollywood. And we'll take a look at some of the controversies that continually stir up this town, from pressure groups to the serious business of stars protecting themselves against potential assassins. We'll begin a five-part report on that subject Thursday. First up, though, the Emmys. The stars did indeed twinkle in Pasadena last night for the 33rd Annual Emmy Awards. By now, you all know that Hill Street Blues won a record eight Emmys. The highly rated miniseries Shogun and the comedy Taxi were the other big winners. As always, the Emmys were a show unto themselves. We got a peek at how it all gets put together. And we spoke with winners and losers alike. How do you think your chances are here this evening? Oh, none. I'm just here for the ride. I hope I win, of course. What do you think your chances yourself are tonight? <laughs> I'm thinking about dinner. <laughs> And I'm thinking about the fight Wednesday night. The membership getting together without uh, solicitation and saying you're doing a good job, that's always lovely. This is like a family reunion, right. and like some of the relatives, you're real close to them, and some of them you're more distant, and, but there's still like this family kind of feeling. That's what I like to go to the award show for. I, of course, didn't believe it. I am Cinderella. I was very moved. Oh, I tell you, I was more nervous about accepting this than anything I've ever done in my entire life. And you don't have to believe it if you don't want it, but it's true. One of the people thought to be a sure winner for Best Actor was Richard Chamberlain for Shogun, but he didn't win. We spoke with Richard before the awards about his nomination. In, in art, those kinds of comparisons, best is, is, is almost impossible to determine. But this artificial thing has been set up, so it's, it is fun to win, and it is sad to lose. But a day or two afterwards, uh, it doesn't really matter anymore. It really matters up to and including the presentation, and afterwards it doesn't seem to, to, to have much significance. The Emmy Awards was a slick, highly polished production, but it took lots of long hours to get that look. Thanks to Emmy executive producers Gary Smith and Dwight Hemian, we recorded some of the madness the day before the show. Uh, 
Same to you, Shirley. Except on rare occasions, Shogun, for example, television is really not an art, it's a craft. And awards for craftsmanship are good, we all need recognition, newspapers have their Pulitzers, but they are not generally handed out by the bushel basket full, nor with the unending hoopla and fanfare that always accompany the Emmys. Consequently, the day after and even the year after, a Pulitzer means a lot, while an Emmy and $165 will get you the same pair of overpriced Gucci's. Someday I hope we'll learn to do it differently. A dozen Emmys a year, say, awarded maybe even without regard to category, to 12 people judged to have made extra special contributions to television that year. Maybe then we could even get in and out of the show in the hour it ought to take. Like it's you know we're part partners here. I wish we were. <laughs> if like millions of other women you identify with that expectant mother, then you'll be excited to know Bert wants to be a daddy. I found out why in part one of our week-long look at Bert Reynolds, the hottest actor in Hollywood. Bert Reynolds has a new movie opening this week. It's called Paternity, about a man who hires a woman to have his baby. To promote the film, Burt was recently on the back lot of Paramount Studios shooting a special TV commercial. For the commercial, 50 pregnant women were invited to screen the film and told they would be interviewed later. What they weren't told was that the interviewer would be Burt Reynolds. I'm surprised to see you here. Well, I'm glad to see you. Oh, thank you. We can meet here every night thank if you, you like. Thank you, I'd love it. <laughs> and you're gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you. You're not only uh, going to have a baby, but you're very bright. <laughs> so now that I have experience in this, you know, maybe yeah. I'd like to do it over again with someone who knows yeah. what they're doing, you know? Yes. <laughs> Would you? Is that an offer? Yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Did you like the movie? I loved it. Uh -huh. Thank I liked you. it. I was hysterical. Really? Yeah. Is this, so your, you? is this your first baby? This is my second. Your second? Mm hmm Oh, well then... I'm an old pro. I really am talking to an experienced yes. person here. <laughs> yes, you well, are. you know how this is done. I sure do. Right. Uh -huh. This is how it started, wasn't it? Oh, yes. <laughs> I'd go through morning sickness for you any day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Gosh, I've, I've had so many nice things said tonight. I feel like it's, you know, we're part partners here. I wish we were. <laughs> I... <laughs> In the movie, Bert plays Buddy Evans, a successful businessman who has everything except what he wants most, a child. He decides the best way to have a baby is to find a mother through the classifieds. But that can lead to some unusual results. What are those? What are what? Those things on your teeth. They're braces. I know they're braces. But do you have to wear them? No. They're the latest in costume jewelry. Of course I have to wear them. I see. Well, it's just that I don't want my son to look like Jaws, too. <laughs> well, he could end up with your forehead. What's wrong with my forehead? Look at those lines. What lines? Looks like it's suffering from erosion. As long as we're talking about looks, your nose isn't exactly classic. Has anyone ever suggested that you plant corn in your eyebrows? My eyebrows are fine. Sure, if you're into wildlife. Can you tell us about Buddy? What kind of a person is he? He likes people, he loves children, especially everybody else's. And he suddenly discovers one day that he's 44 years old and has nothing to say that Buddy Evans was here, except, you know, a piece of rock when he dies. So he decides that this is a very sexist attitude, that the best way to do it would be to have a child, a son, of course. Um, and uh, that's his attitude, not mine. It's interesting that Burt would do a film like Paternity because his life is similar to his screen character, Buddy Evans. At 45 years old, Burt also is an unmarried businessman who longs for children, something he finds missing in his life. I've read that you said that paternity is the story of your life. Is that true? No, they couldn't. That wouldn't be on television. <laughs> it wouldn't be no, saccharine sweet. They couldn't get that on television. Somewhere. 
it's, uh, it's just that uh, a lot of things that happen in the movie um, are true uh, in, in terms of me that I would love very much to have a child, you know, and uh, I'm not really sure whether I'd be very good at being a husband, and that's kind of true of this guy. So you're ready to be a parent, but you're not ready to be a husband yet? Uh, not at the moment. I don't know. I think it's silly to ever say that you're you're never going to do this or you're never going to do that because you, you constantly change your mind and people change your mind, things change your mind, women change your mind. Bert can keep the kids, just send me his women. And Lana Turner, who hasn't given an interview in years, has ended her silence at long last. In France at the DeVille Film Festival, which ended last night, the blonde superstar made a rare public appearance and made news by telling our Robin Leach that she'll be returning to the silver screen. Since 71, I've been doing plays, theater. So I've had 10 years of it, and I would like to go back to where I started, films. I mean, that's where I grew up. That's whatever I know I learned from that. Stage work is so different. So I'm hoping that I'm able to do, to find the right stories. I refuse to do trash. That's why I've stayed off the screen for three and four years at, at a time. Which is why people think that you... That I've become a recluse. And I or have that you've not. retired. No, I'm a very active woman. You'll see a lot more of Lana Turner in this exclusive interview when the first hour-long weekend edition of Entertainment Tonight premieres a few days from now. While Lana Turner was being honored in France, Larry Hagman was just honored in this country. The crafty old J.R. of Dallas fame was with his mother, actress Mary Martin, as he was presented with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. With his many fans around him, we spoke with Larry about his secret for success. I just like working. I, I'm, a, I'm a working actor and a journeyman actor. I believe that work breeds work. The more you work, the more you work. And I like working. I'm a workaholic. As long as I get three or four days off a week. <laughs> nice work if you can get it. Bo Derek was in London this week helping to hype the opening of Tars and the Ape Men and making plans for her next two movies, A Pirate Saga and a film about Adam and Eve. Three guesses which part she'll play. While Bo is doing her best to boost the earnings of Tarzan, already one of the summer's top hits with grosses of over $30 million, some people are trying to keep her from spending her share. The estate of Tarzan creator Edgar Rice Burroughs, which tried to stop the movie from being made in the first place, has now gone to court to get a slice of the money pie. Cheetah's relatives have yet to be heard from. One of last night's Emmy nominees was Evita Perone, in which Faye Dunaway gave a remarkable performance in the title role. Million people out there. Isabel, please explain to her what it means when two generals come and ask for a man's resignation. They came with a document. I don't care about documents or generals. I'm talking about the workers. Your people. What use are they to me if I can't reach them? You can reach them. Now Dunaway is about to set Jaws wagging with another biography, playing Joan Crawford in Mommy Dearest. After a New York press preview of the new film, several friends of the late actress gathered at dinner to swap stories about Joan and some of her off-screen antics. They all raved about Dunaway's uncanny impersonation, the amazing way she has of making herself look like her subject. Here's a sneak peek at Mommy Dearest opening next week. Again? I'll give you a bigger head start. Come on, Tina. Deborah Harry of Blondie. She's a mixed bag of music and personality. Now she's looking to establish a solo career in both music and acting, while keeping ties to her band Blondie and her boyfriend, Chris Stein. What do you do for relaxation? I like to read. I like to dance. Listen to music. I like roller skating. I like swimming. One way or another, Debbie Harry is not your average American girl. 
As lead singer for Blondie, the most popular American new wave group, Debbie has established herself as the female David Bowie, a rock chameleon changing identities as easily as hair color. For now, she's settled on Fire Engine Red, and she's looking to develop a new Debbie Harry, one removed from the image of Blondie. Fans wonder why the change to Red. I couldn't fairly, to the rest of the guys in the band, take Blondie's identity and then go on and do a solo project. I thought that that would have been really uh, rude. That new solo album is called Cuckoo. The look and the sound was inspired by the work of H.R. Giger, the designer of the science fiction movie Alien. That's the latest from Debbie Harry, the glamour girl of New Wave, but sometimes that image rubs against her plain Jane upbringing as an adopted child from Hawthorne, New Jersey. Back when Debbie was in junior high, she began to experiment with makeup and strange hair dyes until she finally settled on a golden blonde, like her idol Marilyn Monroe, who she fantasized as her real mother. I think a lot of girls uh, identify with Marilyn and we shared a certain kind of uh, femininity and vulnerability. In the 60s, Debbie mixed with the Greenwich Village crowd. Her addiction to heroin and years as a playboy bunny are well known. With the help of Chris Stein, her current live-in love, she kicked the habit and formed Blondie in 1973. Soon it was hit after hit with Heart of Glass, One Way or Another, Call Me, and the recent release, Touch by Your Presence, Dear. Was it destiny? But the question remains, is Blondie top of the charts because of the music or Debbie's looks? I, mean, I don't think the, the image is any more blatant than a lot of male rock singers, you know? I don't think what Debbie's done on stage is more blatantly sexual than Jagger or Rod Stewart or what have you. Those guys go pretty far, and because they're men, they, they're allowed to do it. People are so turned on by you. They really have to touch you and meet you and talk to you and just, like, look in your face and look in your eyes. You know, fans are just, like, so have so much inside of them that they never have a release for. And you are their release. You get to express a lot of emotions that sometimes they don't get to express. Those emotions transform Debbie into her stage personality. Now she's looking to channel those emotions into movies. She's done two features, and she's looking for more. I'm available. Last season's TV holdout was Larry Hagman of Dallas. This season, it's Eric Estrada of Chips. What's he won? A $12 million package, that's what. We'll have that story on tomorrow's edition of Entertainment Tonight. Last night on the Emmys, the first lady of TV comedy was honored with a special tribute from the Academy. She was honored by the Academy during the first televised Emmy Awards back in 1954 for the best situation comedy. Here's that magic moment now. We didn't expect to win this tonight. We're awful happy we did. It wouldn't be right to call our writers up here and give it to them, would it? <laughs> but I wish we could. Thanks very, very much. We're awful proud to be a part of this industry. Really, we are. We're trying real hard, and we're going to keep it up. Thank you. And finally, Dudley Moore, who stands 5'2", told People Magazine that the favorite song of he and girlfriend, Susan Anton, she's 6'1", is I've Got You Under My Chin. Oh. Somebody ought to tell Dudley that joke comes up a little short. That's entertainment tonight for September 14th, 1981. We're awfully glad you joined us. Tomorrow we'll have more of Burt Reynolds plus Walter Matthau and Brooke Shields. We leave you now with the music of Blondie. Good night. Good night, Good night. everybody. Good night.